Hi, I am Jennifer Purcell, and welcome to my podcast, Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge, where we will discuss, discover, and learn more about the challenges and triumphs of those with NLD and other learning challenges. I do have a website for this podcast, and it is called livingwithnld.com. I also have a Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter account for the podcast. They are all under the same name, which is Living with NLD. I also have a YouTube channel for the podcast, which can be found by Googling the title of the podcast, which is Living with an Invisible Learning Challenge. I would like to tell you about a nonprofit that I use for my research for this podcast. It is called The NBLD Project, and I use their blog for my research. They are a nonprofit that is based in New York and is trying to get NVLD back on the DSM, and they provide many resources for people with NVLD on their website. I'll provide you with the website for them in the podcast description. All proceeds from the ads on this podcast will be donated towards the NVLD project. Please feel free to explore the other topics on the podcast, and hopefully you will learn something new from them. I hope you enjoy today's episodes. So on September 18th will be the next Facebook chat for members of my podcast audience that have NLD or other learning challenges. And this group creates a safe space for you to talk about anything that may be on your mind relating to NLD or any other learning challenges that you may have or relating to other personal things that you may be going through. And creates a group that has confidentiality built into it as well and will support you with anything that you need support with. And it is on September 18th at 10 a.m. Pacific time zone and it goes until 11.30 a.m. Pacific time zone. So I hope you will be able to come to that. If you would like to join, please let me know by emailing me at livingwithnld at gmail.com or message me on the Living With NLD Facebook page. Thank you and have a great Friday. Bye. To access the testimonials, there are two ways. There's a testimonial page with the full quotes and then there is a slideshow on the home page with excerpts of the longer ones and the short ones. On the last uh, image of the testimonial quote with Julia's quote, you can click on it and it will take you to the testimonial page where it shows you all of them with the full quoted testimonials. I did it that way because I wanted it to be easier to read on the home page and some of them were a little longer than a testimonial usually is. And then I wanted to make sure that you could see the whole testimonial on the testimonial page. So I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't, you can email me at livingwithnld at gmail.com and I will try to show you how to access it. Thank you. Hope you're having a good weekend. Bye. Today's episode will be the second part of the interview with Christina Cummings. So it will be more about CBT therapy and DBT therapy and the differences between the two and about her specialty, which is DBT therapy. And I hope you enjoy the second part of her interview. Thank you. I wanted to kind of circle back to what you were saying with the gifts that NVLD people have. That is very true with MVLD and autism and Asperger's where, and I think ADH too, where they have, they're more gifted in certain areas like auditory or math or writing or science. And if they don't, if they focus too much on the negative, they may not realize that, what their gifts are. And, their potential. So 
I 100% agree with you. Um, oftentimes when people start working with me when they're coming in, they, they don't believe that. They don't believe those words to be true. And one of my goals for them is that by the end of treatment, they have come to realize what gifts they are contributing, what they have to contribute to this world. That, and honestly, I, I don't mean to sound like two, you know, like let's all hold hands and sing kumbaya, but like really how their presence makes the world better. Yeah, it, it does. I mean, it, there weren't people who had special ed needs. I don't know if anybody would know about them, you know? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, especially with NLD, with it being one of the ones that is so not known about and still being discovered. Um, so I know you were already kind of talking about this question a little bit, but do you want to talk more about the four components of DBT? Yeah, well, the four components of DBT, I was thinking about this a little bit um, over the last few days, and the four components are really the therapy session, the diary card, the skills education, and the um, consultation team. And then the four modules of skills are mindfulness, mm -hmm. knowing how to tune in to what's going on within you and around you, interpersonal effectiveness, so uh, having interactions that work with other people, emotion regulation, learning how to regulate your own emotions, and distress tolerance. So these are things like dealing with like crisis level emotions, dealing with um, addictions or issues of not acceptance, uh, non-acceptance of reality as it is. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And that makes me think a little bit of my own uh, part where I know in college I was at a phase where I was, um, I was overeating to absorb emotions. And I didn't realize I was doing that initially. Um, I didn't know I was, what I was doing. Um, but then when I realized what I was doing, I tried to stop it and um, tried to get more comfortable with expressing my emotions instead of suppressing them. And it's still a little hard today because I was used to suppressing them for a while in my childhood and just being comfortable with expressing them. Sometimes it's hard to turn them off. Yeah, um, it can be scary, like, a, like floodwaters. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And realizing, well, maybe that's just what I need in that moment and that it's okay. Um, and that's, that's what I try to be comfortable with then and just let myself get through it and hold my dog or something like that. And that helps. Yeah. Um, as a fellow dog lover, um, it, dogs are really great emotion regulation tools. <laughs> um, each one of those modules you go, you could go into so much detail about because there's, there's just wonderful gems in each of it. You know, the only um, other thing that I really want to make clear about those skills modules is mindfulness. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to want to skim over mm -hmm. and it's the most important part because it sets you up for successful use of all the other skills. So like, really diving into that, that chapter, which it, it's become very common to use this term mindful. And DBT looks at it a little differently, again, with very specifics of this is how you do it. This is what you're supposed to do. Um, not like, let's sit down and meditate. 
Mm-hmm. That's not instructions on how to be mindful in DBT style. You're going to get very clear instructions on what to do and how to do it. And again, this is another reason why people with NBLD really seem to respond well to this because they're like, okay, well, I've never been able to meditate any before, but you're telling me that I'm meditating right now. And I'm like, yes, this is a type of meditation and you're doing it. Yeah, I, I, I can relate to that with the meditating because I usually can't meditate for that long and probably because it has to do with sitting still and trying to be quiet um, and my mind starts doing the monkey mind, um, which happens to neurotypicals probably too. Um, But I know for me, when I walk or if I hike or run, that's easier if I'm moving instead of just sitting. And I find that more meditative and especially if it's outside. Um, So that's my meditation. That's awesome. Being there's something very powerful for a lot of people. There's something very powerful about being outdoors. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so, what are the main techniques of DBT? There are so many. There really are so many. So, um, it's really difficult to pick a few. But I do have some, I guess, favorites, top picks. When really it's so it's so hard to choose, but um, one of them is sounds so simple, but it can be really hard to do when you're in an emotional state, and that's recognizing what state of mind you're in. So mm-hmm. it's something that you learn in DBT, you learn the three different states of mind, and just being able to pick out in the moment what state of mind you're in is a huge skill because that allows you to have an understanding of how to proceed, how to move forward. Um, There's another skill called Dear Man. Most of the skills are acronyms. Mm -hmm. And if anybody listening has something to ask of another person or something that they have to say no to, that they're feeling a little nervous about it, Google Dear Man it really lays out for you exactly how to say this, make this request or say no. It's very clear, like I said, step one, two, three, four, and um, effective in a way that will, fingers crossed, hopefully get you what you want. Um, Another skill that I mentioned earlier is called opposite action. So, This is when you're having a feeling and you are not liking this feeling. So you choose actively to act opposite to that feeling. I don't want to go to work. I'm dreading work, dreading it, dreading it, dreading it. Well, I'm going to get up and I am not only going to go to work, but I'm going to put a cute outfit on. I'm going to do my hair exactly how it's going to make me feel like really nice. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to go to work and, and make sure that I say hello to as many people as I can when I walk in. So it's, it's really actively putting yourself into this behavior of acting as if you were not dreading in the goal of changing that behavior, excuse me, changing that emotion of dread. Um, and finally, one thing that's really important to know, one of one of really important techniques is knowing when you're at a skills breakdown point, knowing when you're at such an emotional place that you can't use skills right now. And that what you really need to do is step away and just not make the situation worse. Mm-hmm. Um, so that looks like there's a lot of skills on what exactly to do, but stepping away, like stopping what you're doing, stepping away, maybe that means running some cold water over your face. Maybe that means jumping in a shower. Maybe that means just like going to bed and taking a nap for a few so that you can 
observe where you're at, bring the mindfulness back and proceed forward. That makes sense. Um, I was thinking about some of the steps you were met or techniques you were mentioning where um, like with the uh, opposite action, I can think of where I like sometimes I didn't want to go for my run and I would be like, no, I'm going to go for my run because it will make me like, you know, be able to study better or, um, you know, um, have a clearer mind or something like that. So I would force myself and um, or feel more awake and I would actually thank myself for doing it. I would be like, okay, yes, this was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, 100%. I mean, how often do you get to the end of your run and you're like, oh, I really shouldn't have done that. You know, like that, that's, that, that happens very infrequently. Um, that's a great, a great example of opposite action. And I think that a lot of people can identify with that, with exercise particularly. It's like really a quick turnaround of like, oh, I don't want to. And then you get up and do it and you're like, okay, I'm glad I did this. I feel good. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, actually, I realized I need my computer charger. So I'm just going to stop. Pause. All right. So we were talking about the techniques and I was saying how with the, um, with the running where sometimes I force myself to uh, do it because it makes me feel better. And, you know, I think there's similar things where you, you force yourself to, you know, it can be anything like meditate or um, journal to try to make yourself, uh, you know, maybe get out of the mood you're in and try to, to get in a better mood. Yeah, you know, opposite action. I'm, I'm just thinking of my um, specifically NBLD clients examples. Um, I'm sure a lot of people can relate. Like you have a social event that you can go to and you want to socialize because you want to have connections with people, but it's so difficult and draining that you don't want to go, but you do want to go, but you don't really want to go and you committed to going but then it's time for you to get ready to go and you don't feel like going because you know it is going to be draining and you're going to have to be on you're going to have to be trying your best to read people and respond and interact and um i always encourage people you know within the best of their ability to try opposite action and go out to that social um social interaction, that social gathering, even if right before they go, they may not want to. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. And that makes me think of a book that I read that helps with social teams. It's called MLB from the Inside Out by Michael Brian Murphy. I've talked about it before on the podcast where he, in his second edition, he talks about uh, some different body language and tells you what it helped me because most of, most of it I didn't know what it meant in, in his book. And he had to know what he himself. So it really helped to be able to hear from a fellow and be able to hear. And um, he has another book on the history of NLP and the science behind it. It's, that one's a little trickier to read for, at least it was for me, because of some of the vocabulary. So I had to ask my mom some words and that's um, but the one with body language help in terms of learning what some of the views meant. And, uh, I do try to circle more because it I mean I'm I am a short butterfly, so I like visualizing. Um, it it helps me realize I'm better at this than I think I am. <laughs> um, so maybe I'm getting better. That's great. Um, I know you were talking a little bit about this earlier, but I wasn't sure if you want to say any 
bit more about what a DBT session is kind of like? It does look a little bit different from a traditional talk therapy session because of the diary card. So you really come in and focus on the diary card and focus on any, whatever your top goal is, you focus on that and then secondary goals and third tertiary goals. And so sometimes what I will say is that sometimes people will come in with a story that they have to tell that they really got to get off their chest. And I have to be like, wait, 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 wait. I want to hear it. I do. Let's make sure that we don't have something that's really, really, really important, but maybe it happened five days ago. So it's not at the top of your, your mind right now. Let's go through the diary card and then we'll get to your story. So you kind of like make a little bit of an agenda in that way with the use of the diary card. It does look a little different than other therapies. I could think of myself joining a little bit of the story that happened Yeah. 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 Oh, I'm sure. But let's look at this first. Um, and then also, how does DBT help people? There's so so much of that has been sprinkled through our conversation already. But I think what it comes down to is that there's very specific steps and skills and strategies to come back to. Um, like I said before, it's not just sitting down and meditate or it's not just, just be mindful of other people, tune in to other people. No, it goes really deep into exactly what you would do in order to be mindful of the person you're speaking with. And that level of detail helps people to take the guessing out of it. You don't need to have this like impromptu, like ready to try new things. Like you've got your skills in your back pocket or really on an app on your phone that you're able to go to and say like, okay, these are the interpersonal skills. I'm going to use this one. And taking that guessing work out of life can be a huge stress relief. It's just like, you know, you get to focus on one thing at a time, focus on learning one skill at a time. And it makes, it makes people feel more competent and therefore increases people with NVLDs um, confidence because they know that they are, they can do these things. So that increasing of the feeling of competency, like I've got this, I can do these things and therefore their self-worth increases. Ultimately though, DBT helps people with NBLD because it allows them to examine, investigate, understand, and implement new behaviors in order to meet their goals. It takes all the judging and blaming out of the equation because it doesn't, judging and blaming gets us nowhere closer to our goals. Just thinking about um, that when you mentioned the app, I was like, that's really cool where you look on your phone and it's right there because that, you 
know that the senior that would be for Yeah, agreed. And then this is um, kind of going in the same thing. How may it not have been able to do it? Like if they're not using it correctly. Yeah, um, one of the most frustrating things uh, for clients in general with DBT is when to try a skill or when to let things ride and not go there. Um, and then when things don't work out right, it's easy to say like, okay, it didn't work. However, in that idea of examining and really investigating and understanding, we have to look at, did they use the skill correctly? Was it the right skill to use given the circumstances? Was the environment more powerful than they were? So maybe they did everything right. And all of that can be really frustrating. It really can be. It's, it's one big experiment. Going into DBT therapy is like saying like, okay, I am signing up to do an experiment on myself and to figure out what's going to make my life better versus what's going to make my life harder. Uh, and it's not an easy process. So Marsha Lenahan in her skills book, the creator of DBT, she said that the path out of hell is through misery. And I view therapy is kind of a miserable process. It can be very painful. And having to withstand that pain for someone with NBLD who is already, who's living a life oftentimes with a great deal of pain. Um, having to face that pain and try new things when you're already like in pain can be extremely difficult. So it's not, it's not an easy process. It's not necessarily, um, a, it's, it's not a fun process. It's really not. And it's the process that some people need to go through in order to get out of that hell and get out of the misery. So um, those are the two main things that come to mind for me the difficulty in analyzing what went wrong when someone tried to use a skill and it didn't work and the the difficult nature of therapy to begin with that we're not going and talking about the stories that someone wants to talk about in that moment we're going through the diary card and looking at that thing that they actually don't really want to talk about it would be a lot easier to avoid and it's my job to not let them avoid it. I just lost my audio on you. Okay, we're back. Okay, had a little technical difficulty there. Um, so I was just saying that made sense to me where I was talking about the um, the hindering piece with the pain of therapy and the uh, trying new things and um, you know reflecting on some of the therapy I've done that makes sense to me because it it can add more stress to your life when you have an LB or some another learning challenge and. That, you know, if you already have a lot of stress in your life, it's like, do I want more? And sometimes it can help get rid of it too. 
So, it, you know, it's the dilemma of, is it gonna help or is it gonna alleviate? Um, and it might, it might do both um, at, at times. And I think it depends on what your goal is in therapy to, to try to maybe be more social or um, regulate your emotions better or I don't know, um, <laughs> work better with, um, you know, social cues or something like that for NBLB people. Um, but I can definitely relate to the, the pain and also just the constant, you know, not always pain, but, you know, thinking, is this person going to think of me differently than in their mm -hmm. typical? Um, and, you know, so the, the self-talk, you know, and um, realizing to just you need to get that out of your head because <laughs> mm -hmm. um, it's not helping. Mm -hmm. actually. Mm -hmm. um, and because I was talking a little bit about goals, I was just wondering if you could maybe share a little bit about maybe some of the goals your clients have. That's um, yeah, a lot of my clients with NBLD are looking for finding uh, meaningful work life that is satisfying for them without being intensely stressful. Mm -hmm. um, which is a, it, that's a really hard thing to find. And you add a learning difference on top of that, and it can make it even more difficult to find. Um, yeah, right under that, I think the second most common goal is finding and maintaining meaningful relationships, um, romantic relationships often, um, and sometimes friendships, but more often this means romantic relationships. Mm -hmm. And um, given that DBT is my specialty, a lot of the people that find their way to me are struggling with recurrent suicidal thoughts. So a uh, primary goal is to eliminate those suicidal thoughts. Mm -hmm. I can relate to all of those. <laughs> um, and that laugh was just a release. Um, but because I've, I've had suicidal thoughts, um, I don't have them anymore, really. Only oh, because of the podcast. I think mean, that's helped a lot. Thank you for the audience. Um, uh, that just helped me feel better. Um, and, you know, more worthy. Um, and not so much of a burden on my family because I know sometimes I feel that way because of how they can all be and I I know it's not always easy for them but I also know that they're willing to help and um, I know that I also try to help when it gets challenging for them with NLB and I think that helps too because it goes both ways and that that kind of brings into the relationships where it could be family or friends or romantic and you know that that's a challenging area because um you know people with NLD um they can be um I don't I don't know if you you've heard of this before but they can be ghosted and it if somebody doesn't know what that is, I'll briefly say what it is. It's basically where you try to contact somebody, whether it's a friend or somebody you're dating, and they don't get back with you, and they usually don't say why. And it usually happens over some period of a month or, or more. And um, I thought that happened to me a few times. And um, it it hurts and um, it's 
spoiler alert, but I will be doing a podcast episode on that in the future. <laughs> yeah. Um, there is that term, the dating game. Yeah. You know, like dating is a game. And that is a social game that does not come easily to people with NBLD. Mm -hmm. It's not a game that is enjoyable for a lot of people. Um, but navigating that that game, it like especially those first few dates when you don't know someone, mm -hmm. you're not in the area where you can like say like, oh, I have NBLD and this is exactly what it is because you're just just getting to know someone but it's just incredibly difficult and I don't envy any of my you know like 20 something NBLD clients that are in that dating world I'm sorry I'm sorry it does suck so while I do push for change in some ways there's just a lot of validation because um like using apps and uh, it's, it's, it's all just very complicated. And it is this social game that um, is a huge focus on so many of my sessions each week. It really like talking about like, well, okay, let's, let's think about this. Let's analyze this. Let's use our mindfulness skills. So you can totally tune in to what exactly happened not your interpretation of what happened, but what actually happened, what you saw, what you heard. And then we can try to examine it and move on from there. Um, that makes sense to me because when I think about um, dating, and uh, I haven't done it since COVID, but I want to go back into it. And when I think of going back into it, I know trying to balance of when to talk about personal things like NLD and the timeline. I'm like, well, if something comes up before I'm ready to talk about it, maybe there's ways to talk a little bit about the challenges I have without saying NLD is what mm -hmm. I'm talking about with my therapist. Mm -hmm. And I think that that may be doable depending on why it comes up or the, the um, scenario. Um, and it, it'll just depend, um, like if it's something social or, um, you know, with maybe something like driving. <laughs> um. It does, it all depends on you as a person and the situation and all those variables that's what makes it so difficult. Because mm -hmm. if I could, if I could say to my client, like, to any of my clients, like, look, this is what you do. This is how you navigate this. This is what you do. Man, they'd be so happy. But because that's just not how it works. Um, we're, we're thinking on our feet in that dating game. Mm -hmm. And it makes it quite difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You do have to think on your feet, and sometimes that's hard to do. It's kind of hard to do for people with healthy. Mm -hmm. um, so. As I wrap up, there are some things I would like to share with you, my audience. Please know that just because I have a podcast doesn't mean that I'm perfect in every way and don't make mistakes. I make them every day and try to learn from them. I hope that this podcast helps you feel included, not alone, inspired, safe, and encouraged to make your life a little easier for you every day or chance you have the opportunity to. I would like to hear from you, especially if you have topics that you would like to know more about relating to NLD. I know I'm not an expert, but I do know I have the living experience of having it. Also, please email me if you would want to be interviewed on this podcast or if you need support with something related to NLD. I'm always happy to help in any way I can. I hope you enjoyed today's episode and I will talk to you next Friday. Bye.